A time to thank and praise God. Let's talk to God together. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us safely to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power so that we will not dishonor you or be overcome by the hardships of life. And in all we do today, direct us and help us to do your good will. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's now time for the English spot. The first one, the first bit of English is an expression. Can't see the forest for the trees. If you can't see the forest for the trees, then you are too close to a situation. You are too focused on one thing, so you can't see everything else. You are unable to understand a situation clearly because you are too involved in it. You are too worried about all the small details, so you can't understand the whole situation. If you can't see the forest for the trees, it's like you are standing so close to one tree that you can't see all the other trees in the forest. If you can't see the forest for the trees, you need to take a step back and look around you. You need to try to see the whole picture or the whole problem before you make a decision. Here's an example. Market Beat Financial Magazine says that investors who are selling their shares in Spotify can't see the forest for the trees. They say that investors should not focus too much on the drop in the Swedish company's profits over the last six months. They say Spotify has over 138 million paid subscribers and over 300 million users each month, with more people using streaming services during the global pan pan pandemic. Example two, the Philippines government says that people who criticize its response to the pandemic cannot see the forest for the trees. Presidential spokesman, Mr. Harry Rock, says that it's unfortunate that some people only focus on the total number of cases in the country and ignore the rest of the data that shows a significant increase in the number of recoveries and a sharp decline in deaths from the virus, which has now fallen to 2.7% of people infected. Okay, the next word is biography. It's a noun. A biography is the story of a person's life which is written by someone else. A biography could include details about when and where the person was born, their childhood, their accomplishments, their family. A biography is normally a book or a movie. If a person writes the story of their own lives, we call this an autobiography. Here's an example. Leonard, my 50-year friendship with a remarkable man is the biography of actor Mr. Leonard Nimoy. And it was written by fellow actor William Shatner. In the book, William describes how they first met, became friends, and then went on to make six Star Trek films together and 79 Star Trek TV shows. Example two. Some people say that the best thing that famous writer Ms. Agatha Christie ever wrote was her own autobiography. In her book, she discusses her happy childhood, her affectionate relationship with her mother, her first husband's adultery, and how much she enjoyed writing 66 detective novels during her career, which sold over 2 billion copies around the world. Now it's time to have a little discussion with the people you're with and the people around you here at church. Which of the following biographies would you like to read most? 
So you have two minutes to talk to the people around you or the people you're with. Which of the following biographies would you like to read most? And maybe you could say why as well. So the first one, Audrey Hepburn, Steve Jobs, Malala Yousafzai. I can't say her name. <laughs> Pardon? Okay. She, that's all right. She fought for women's education against the Taliban. And the last one, Donald Trump's biography. So you've got two minutes to talk to the people next to you. Which one would you like to read the most? Okay, our last bit of English is relationship. It's a noun. Relationship is the way two or more things are connected, especially people. People who are closely connected have a relationship. A relationship is more important than just an acquaintance or friendship. Example one. Here is a conversation between a father and daughter who have a good relationship. Daughter. Dad, am I pretty? Yes, you are very pretty. Dad, what does pretty mean? Pretty can mean many different things. How do you know I'm pretty? I just know. <laughs> Example two. Researchers say that phone fubbing is hurting relationships with other people. Phone fubbing, such a funny word, <laughs> fubbing, <laughs> snubbing. It's where you neglect people because you're distracted by your phone. Dun, dun, dun. So if you're always checking your phone, then watch out. Researchers recommend not looking at your phone when you wake up, guilty, only checking social media once or twice a day, hmm, <laughs> do things like exercising, a hobby, or reading, hmm, that's good advice. Now it's time to have a discussion again. So with the people you're with, which of the following is the most important thing in a relationship? We listen to each other, we share our feelings, we see each other often, 
We have the same interests. We take care of each other. So you've got two minutes to talk about which of the following is most important in a relationship. Good morning. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Together, thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in the Bible. And thank you for inviting us to come into your kingdom by entrusting our lives to Jesus Christ. As you speak to us this morning, we ask that you will help us to listen with eager ears and to obey with joyful hearts. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Uh, today's reading from the Bible is from John, John chapter 5. The Apostle John says this, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is right, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony would not be valid, but there is someone else who testifies about me, and I know that what he says about me is true. You remember John the Baptist and how he testified to the truth, but the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I mention John so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and shining, and you were willing to enjoy his light for a while. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, because the works which the Father has given me to do, the very works that I do, this shows that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me, but you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face. You do not have his word living in you because you do not believe the one who he sent. You read the script, scriptures constantly because you think you find eternal life there, but you miss the forest for the trees. These scriptures are all about me, and here I am standing right in front of you, and you aren't willing to receive from me the life you say you want. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. 
But if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe me when you accept glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. If you believe Moses, you have believed me because he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Father's Day if you're a father. I hope your uh, family have spoilt you or at least shown you some tenderness and kindness today. Uh, we're continuing our series in John's Gospel and we're uh, finishing uh, John chapter 5 and today we're looking at uh, this idea of proof and what that uh, means when we're talking about Jesus and the life that he offers to us. Uh, so how about we begin by praying. Father, we thank you that you have uh, shown your love to us, you've proved your love uh, by sending your son Jesus, and thank you that he ends all arguments, that if what he says is true, then uh, you are true, and what you offer is true, and the life that you give is true. So help us, Lord, to uh, think deeply about Jesus, to be honest and open, and to get to know him better so that we may know you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, everywhere you go today, it seems that people want proof. So if you've bought something from a shop and you need to return it for some reason, when you return it, you will need to provide proof that you bought it there. So you might give them a, a receipt or something like that. Or if you uh, go and open a bank account, well, then you'll need to give them proof that you are who you say you are. So you'll have to maybe give them a, a birth certificate or, or a passport or something like that. And really, I think this idea of us needing proof and wanting proof is a good thing. But friends, the problem is that providing enough proof is often very difficult. It's very complex and it's never perfect. For example, thanks Isaac, in a court of law in Australia, you know, if someone, if the police catch someone and they think this person is a murderer, will the police have to prove that the person actually did kill the other person? And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Indeed, within our own legal system, uh, when someone is you know, found guilty of murder, we have this phrase, you know, they are found guilty of murder beyond reasonable doubt. And this means that, uh, there, that there is enough proof that any reasonable person would look at the proof and say, yes, that person did the crime. But friends, even after these 12 people have made their decision. They've looked at all the proof and they've made their decision, either guilty or not guilty. Still, sometimes, it's not clear. Still, sometimes there is some doubt. Sometimes there is reasonable doubt. And that is why sometimes, very rarely, you'll find that an innocent person goes to jail. And that is because proof is never perfect. It's not complete. And the people who give the proof, well, they're not perfect. And they don't know everything. They don't know the whole story. And so proof is very complex. It's not as simple as we think it is. And so, friends, let me ask you a question. If you're married, how do you know that your husband or your wife loves you. Now, how do you know beyond all reasonable doubt that your husband or your wife actually does love you? How do you know? 
They wash the dishes for you. They tell you how much they love you. Maybe they give you flowers. Maybe they even cut your toenails. Now friends, that's proof that they love you. Well, friends, how much proof do you need for you to be completely satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that your spouse loves you? Friends, how much proof do we need? Well, friends, two weeks ago, thanks, Isaac, here in John chapter 5, we saw that Jesus healed a man who had been paralysed for something like 38 years. And ever since that day, on that Sabbath, these guys, the Pharisees, really, really hate Jesus. And they start harassing Jesus, and then they want to kill Jesus. But instead of leaving Jerusalem or, or hiding somewhere, Jesus stands his ground, he looks them in the eye, and he tells them the truth. And that is what we saw last week. Last week we heard Jesus explain why he healed on the Sabbath. And he said things like this, thanks Isaac. He said, my father is working and so am I. And he said, the Father loves me and includes me in everything that he is doing in this world. And he said, I never work alone, but I always do, do what I see my Father doing. And Jesus said, I am the Son of Man who has received authority from God to judge all people. In other words, I have the authority from God to speak the truth. And in speaking the truth... I reveal what is inside the hearts of people. And I divide people into those that love God and those that don't love God. Now, friends, if we're honest, these words, these statements that Jesus make about himself are remarkable. I mean, if these words are true, then the Pharisees and us and everyone else in this world should drop to their knees and confess that Jesus is Lord. If these things are true. Now friends, before you drop to your knees and say Jesus is Lord, which would be a very good and reasonable thing to do, before you do that, God wants you to know that he doesn't expect you to do that without proof without reasonable proof. God does not expect us to make life-changing decisions without him giving us enough proof. And I say this because there are many people in our world today who think that being a Christian means you don't think. You know, they think our oh, faith and knowledge are separate things. That's what many, many people think. They think that having faith is like taking one big step in the dark with your eyes closed. But friends, taking one big step in the dark with your eyes closed is never a good idea, especially if you're standing near some stairs. But this is what many modern people think faith is. They think that faith is just blindly believing the unbelievable and having no proof. But that's not what faith is. Faith actually is this, thanks Isaac. Faith equals trust. That's what faith is. The word faith means to trust. And so it doesn't really matter if you're a, a Christian or not a Christian, if you believe in God or don't believe in God. The truth is that every single day we all trust people and we all trust things. And this means we all have faith. We all have faith. And some of that faith is very reasonable based on proof. And some of that faith is very unreasonable. 
So let me give you an example of reasonable faith. Thank you, Isaac. Friends, when you go to your fridge and you're just about to open the door, do you ever stop and think, I wonder if the light will go on today? Do you ever think like that? No, I wonder if the light will go on. Well, you don't, do you? You expect the light to go on. So why don't you think, I wonder if the light will go on today? Well, you don't because you have reasonable proof. Because every single time in the last zillion years that you've opened the fridge door, the light has come on. And so this time, of course, you expect, you have faith that the light will go on. You have reasonable faith that the light will come on. Now, I want to give you an example of unreasonable faith. Thank you, Isaac. Friends, when you're about to cross Beamy Street, before you cross, you're waiting, you press the button, the, the green man comes on, the buzzer goes on. Do you ever stop and think, I wonder if the drivers will stop when I cross the road? Do you ever think like that? Well, you don't. You see the green light, you hear the buzzer, and you just go. Well, friends, that shows you that you have faith. When you cross that road because you see the green light, you have faith. You have real faith. You have faith that the drivers who drive down Campsie and Beamish Street, you have faith that they know what they're doing. You have faith that they're not on their phones. You have faith that they're not in a rush. You have faith that they are really responsible people who service their cars very regularly so when they hit their brakes, the car will stop and you don't die. See, you have faith when you cross Beamy Street. And friends, I'm here to tell you that you have faith unreasonable faith when you cross Beamy Street. Because I've seen how people drive in Kansi and they're not concentrating. Friends, we all have faith. Some of it's reasonable, some of it's not. We all trust people and we trust things. So, how much proof do you need to Cross Beamy Street happily. How much faith does it take, or how much proof does it take, for you to decide it's safe to come to church again? How much proof do you need? And how much proof do you need to entrust your life to Jesus? There's a big question. How much proof do you need? Well, here at the end of chapter 5, Jesus gives us three proofs. He gives us three truths to help us trust him. Now, friends, these three truths won't guarantee that people will trust in Jesus. After all, the Pharisees were there that day. They heard these three proofs and they did not believe Jesus. And the reason they did not believe Jesus is because God has set up this world so that anyone who doesn't want to believe Jesus doesn't have to. You see, the truth is God will not force anyone to do anything. And so if people want to, you know, find other reasons for the, which explain the wonderful things that Jesus did and said, they'll be able to do that. And they'll be happy with those reasons. And they'll walk away from Jesus happily. And God will let them do that. But, If you really want to know Jesus, 
If you really want to understand him, if you really want to know if he was working with God, then Jesus says, listen to these three rules, these three proofs that I gave the Pharisees who did not believe and who did not want to believe. So friends, are you ready for the proofs? Someone said yes. Well done. Okay, let's go through the three proofs that Jesus gave the Pharisees to show them that he was working with God. Number one, thank you, Isaac. The first reason is, or the first proof, is John the Baptist. Look at verse 31. Jesus says, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony would not be valid. But there is someone else who testifies about me, and I know what he says about me is true. You remember John the Baptist and how he testified to the truth? But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I mention John so that you may be saved. He was a lamp that was burning and shining, and you were willing to enjoy his light for a while. Now, friends, John the Baptist was a really, you know, wild man of God. You know, he lived in the desert, he ate, ate locusts and wild honey, and he prepared people to meet God by preaching these you know, real fiery sermons and by baptising people. Those who repented, he baptised. But friends, John wasn't a trained religious teacher. He didn't go to Pharisee school. He didn't go to Bible college. He had no theological qualifications whatsoever. But John was a prophet of God, a messenger of God, and he spoke the words of God. And really, people came from everywhere to listen to John, to be baptised by him, because they knew he was a man who worked with God. And as we saw back in chapter 1, this prophet of God, John the Baptist, pointed people to Jesus. He told them the story. He told everyone the story. That day that Jesus came to him in the river and John baptised him, and John saw the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus. And then John heard the word of God come from the heavens. This is my son. I am very pleased with him. John told everyone. John pointed everyone to Jesus. And from that day, he taught everyone, this one is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And everyone believed him, except the Pharisees. John was not enough proof for them. Now, the second bit of proof that Jesus gives to the Pharisees is this, number two. He says, you can tell I'm working with God, number two, because of the works that I do. Look at verse 36. Jesus says this, But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, because the works which the Father has given me to do, these very works that I do, they show that the Father has sent me. Now, friends, here Jesus is saying, okay, stop looking at John. Now look at me and what I'm doing, my teaching and my healing. Focus on those things because those things should show you that God has sent me. Those things should teach you that I have authority from God. And friends, the problem for us today is, you know, we don't trust people in authority. You know, modern Australians, we don't really trust people who have authority. And this is because in the past, people have abused their authority. They have used the authority, the power that they have had to hurt and damage other people. And we see this all the time. You know, corrupt politicians. 
We see it in business, in, in families, in sport, and even in churches sometimes. We, we see this corrupt authority, so we don't respect authority. But friends, there is another type of authority that I really want you to think about this morning. And that is the authority that someone has, the authority that comes to them, because they know how to do something really, really well. Let me explain what I mean. You see, when someone can do something really, really well, they have authority. Because they can do what they do, they have authority. And they have the authority and the skill to teach other people what they can do and what we can't do. So, for example, thank you, Isaac. I love listening to music. I love listening to people who make music. And so when I listen to a musician, you know, on a piano or, or, a, or a guitar, just, just create music, beautiful music, I sit there and I enjoy their skill, their mastery, the, the music that they produce. And when I'm listening to these musicians, I don't need any music expert to come to me and say, you should listen to that guy because he's really good. I don't need to listen to an expert. I just need to listen to the music. Because when I listen to the music, then I can see for myself that that musician knows what he's doing. He is an expert musician because he makes beautiful music. And friends, because he is an expert, because he knows what he's doing, he has authority. He has authority to teach other people like me who can't play. That beautiful musician has authority. Well, friends, it's exactly the same way with Jesus. He has authority over all of life. Not just a guitar. Although I think he probably could play guitar very, very well. But Jesus has authority over all of life because he is an expert. He understands life. He made life. He knows how it works. And because he knows everything about life, he has authority and all we have to do is to listen to his music you just have to listen to what Jesus is good at teaching healing and as you expose yourself more to what he can do so well it won't take long but you will see that this man knows what he's talking about. You will see very easily that Jesus knows everything about everything. You will soon know, yes, this Jesus has the authority from God. Friends, as I've said many times before, Jesus has the best available information about life. Jesus has the best available information about life. And this is because he knows everything about our world. He knows what's important for human beings. He knows what's not important for human beings. He understands the human body and so he can heal. He understands how gravity works so he can walk on water. He understands the chemical composition of wine, so he can turn water into wine. Jesus is an expert. And so he has authority. And because he has authority, we should listen to him. 
And when we do listen to him, and when we do what he says to do, we will find that we begin to live life well. And there you have the perfect circle of faith. You listen, you do, and you see that it is true. You see, the works that Jesus does show us that he has authority. And so we should listen to his music. We should listen to his words, his healings. And when we do, when we try them and obey him, we will find, yes, this man is from God. But friends, for the Pharisees, it's not enough. It's not enough proof. They won't believe. So the third proof, thank you Isaac, that Jesus gives us to show us that he is working with God is the teaching of the Bible. Look at verse 37. He says this, And the Father who sent me has testified about me, but you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face. You do not have his word living in you because you do not believe the one he sent. You read the scriptures constantly because you think you'll find eternal life there, but you miss the forest for the trees. These scriptures are all about me, and here I am standing right in front of you, and you aren't even willing to accept from me the life you say you want. I love that translation. That's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They said they wanted eternal life, but they wouldn't come to the one who gave eternal life. Well, why? Well, because these very zealous religious people concentrated so much on, you know, expanding the law and the rules to cover every possible situation in life that they couldn't see the forest for the trees. They were so close to rules that they couldn't see the forest. They couldn't see that the Old Testament was really all about relationship with God. It was all about friendship with God. They they couldn't even see that. They were so close and so consumed by rules that they couldn't See that God offers life and that God sent him to give us God's life. And really, I think God's purpose for the whole Old Testament was, you know, if you read it openly, honestly and humbly, if you just do that, you will learn three things. You will learn that God is working with Jesus. You will learn that Jesus is working with God and you will learn that God is in Jesus. And when you learn that, you will happily entrust your life to him. That's how the Bible works. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's written to show us who Jesus is and what he has come to do to give us a friendship with God so we can have a living relationship with Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the Bible. And so, friends, I think this means that the Bible is not really a biography but more an autobiography. It's God's story. It's his story, history. It's God revealing himself to humans so that we can have a friendship with God. And Jesus is the ultimate proof because Jesus is the clearest revelation of God. 
He is the light, the truth, the way. He is the clearest, biggest, most complete description, revelation, explanation of who God is. He is the biggest proof of all. But even then, the Pharisees will not believe. Even God come in the flesh is not enough proof for them. You see, friends, Jesus' actions, his healings, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, the, the work that he is now doing in this world through his word and his people and his spirit, all these things show us that he works with God, that God works with him to bring God's good into this world. And that is why Jesus healed the paralyzed man on the Sabbath. Friends, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do not leave us in the dark, groping around, not knowing what we're doing. But we thank you so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to be the light, the proof, the one who removes all confusion and all doubt and who clearly shows us what you are like. And we thank you that in his words, in his actions, his healings, his death, his resurrection, his work in our hearts today through your spirit, that he continues to do your work, to bring life where there was death, to bring light where there was darkness. To bring people into a friendship with you. Father, we ask that you will help us to listen to your music, to listen to your words, your truths, to, to practice them, to do them, so that we may see, yes, oh yes, all authority belongs to you. And Father, we ask that you will do this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Now we do have a discussion question. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, which of the three types of proof that Jesus mentions today, which of those is the most important for you? Okay, so with the people around you, if you're at home, with those at home or on the phone or Zoom, which of those three proofs is the most important one for you and why? Okay, you have five minutes. Enjoy your discussion.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, at our best moments, by your grace, we are not sleeping in Gethsemane, but we are awake and listening to your Son's prayer. He knows deep down that he must suffer, but in his perfect humanity he cries out, if it is possible, let this cup pass. In the same way, we sense deep down that this pandemic is appointed in your wisdom for good and necessary purposes. We too must suffer. Your son was innocent, we are not. Yet with him, we too cry out, if it is possible, let this cup pass. So we ask, Lord, do quickly the painful, just and merciful work you have resolved to do. Do not linger in judgment. Do not delay in compassion. Remember the poor, O Lord, according to your mercy. Do not forget the cry of the afflicted. Grant recovery. Grant a cure. Deliver us your poor helpless creatures from these sorrows we pray but do not waste our misery and grief O Lord purify your people from preoccupation with empty materialism and with Christless entertainment cut from us the roots of pride and hate and of living in unjust ways Open the eyes of our hearts to see and savour the beauty of Christ. Move our hearts to your word, your son and your ways. Fill us with compassion and courage and make a name for yourself through us. Let the terrible words of revelation not be spoken over this generation. Yet still they did not repent. As you have stricken bodies, strike now our sleeping souls. Forbid that we would remain asleep in darkness of pride and unbelief. In your great mercy say to these bones, live and bring the hearts and lives of millions back into alignment with the infinite work of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace about.
Now, friends, as usual, on the first Sunday of every month, we're going to begin the month by asking God to bless the people we are with, and we're going to use the words up there on the screen. And so what I want you to do is to remember that what we're doing is asking God to bless the person we say these words to. So you need to look at someone. Uh, We we can no longer touch each other. That's fine. So let's look at uh, someone near you. And I really want you to stress the word you. Okay? Uh, So I'm going to look at Roy, I think. (laughs) Is Is it all right, Roy? Great. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. So let's bless each other to get together saying these words. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look straight at you and give you peace. Amen. Okay. Enjoy your morning tea together. <laughs>